Hi, I'm David Gregg with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. This video is about migratory fish because this is World Migratory Fish Day. I know when I say migratory fish, a lot of you are probably thinking about Pacific salmon leaping up waterfalls. Here on the East Coast, our fish are either more lassadaisical or more cleverly adapted. Take your pick. Herring, like we have in the Saugatucket, need continuous swimming. They don't jump. So if you're a herring, what do you do when you come to an obstacle like, like this? Fish ladders. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. This is the Grand Mac Daddy of fish ladders, at least here in the Northeast. So what makes a fish ladder a good fish ladder or a bad fish ladder? Well, to answer that question, we've gone to our local fish ladder expert, Jim Turek, restoration ecologist with the NOAA Fisheries Restoration Center. He's going to give us a technical tour of the Horseshoe Falls fish ladder in Shannock, Rhode Island. So the, uh, these fish, which include uh, alewife and uh, blueback herring uh, on the Quaquatuck River, they come up in the springtime. The adults return from the ocean after spending three to five plus years in the ocean. And they come up each spring, and it's all uh, dependent upon the water temperature. And so when the water's too cold, the fish don't arrive as early, and they spend more time down in an estuary. Whereas once the water warms, we start getting up into the uh, 50s and 60 degree-ish Fahrenheit temperatures, then the fish start moving. And uh, there's a certain sweet spot that they're gonna be moving up river to find their spawning grounds. So we're standing here at what's called the exit way, the fishway right now. So that's the upstream end where the fish are exiting the fishway. Now, if you're a fishery biologist, you always think about I, talking about a river from the downstream looking up. In contrast, engineers typically look at the river downstream. So uh, yeah, they're, right. they're, they're standing at the, at the far end looking down river. And so they often talk about, okay, we're going to build the fishway on river left. And so today we're on river left in Charlestown on the Pawkatuck River in the village of Shattuck. This is the, what's the, called the Horseshoe Falls Dam, was first constructed, we think, somewhere in the 1830s. Now, we don't have great information on when the actual first mill was built uh, along with the dam, but it's somewhere uh, in, the, in the order of the 1830s, 1840s. There was never a fishway uh, associated with dam, this dam, so effectively, this dam and a series of other downstream dams on the uh, Pawkatuck River eliminated the passage of uh, river herring, American shad, Atlantic salmon, and American, largely American eel as well. And so it wasn't until 2012 when we built this fishway that it allowed fish to pass upriver from downstream. And, and so it's, it was a long, long time coming to get uh, fish passage restoration on the block of time. So we uh, constructed this technical fishway back in 2012 uh, with uh, economic stimulus funds from 2009. And uh, this, is, this fishway is over a million dollars at uh, when it was constructed. Uh, and um, it passes fish. Uh, we, we have done studies on it, the, the river herring that passed through this fishway. It is somewhere over 80% passage efficiency, so we feel pretty good about how it was designed and built. It is inside this uh, trough that we're standing on is a series of baffles. They're wooden baffles. Uh, I believe there's a total of 31 in this fishway. They're spaced every two feet, and they sit at a 40 degree angle it's each baffle. It causes the, 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 the water comes down and basically is kicked back on itself. So it actually drops the velocity uh, uh, to a slower rate than when it comes, the water comes into the baffle. And so the water is coming down and forms uh, miniature eddies above and upstream of each baffle. And so the, when you think about the fishway, 
the highest velocities you would you would think would be at the bottom of the fishway, right? But in fact, the highest velocities are at the top of the fishway, and as the water passes down through each baffle, it's slowed. And so the slowest velocity is at the bottom until you get right at the entranceway where there's what well, we we narrow down the entranceway to what we get is an, an attraction jet flow. So we actually speed up the velocity for a very short distance when it dumps into the uh, entrance pool or tail race or tail water I'm sorry tail water and that's where the fish are attracted into that flow so we need a, a good attraction flow and then once we get them into the, the door and into the fishway then the velocities are slower right. so right now we're at the uh, we're at one of the resting pools uh, and 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 so what this is it's it becomes a flat slope with no baffles in it and it allows the fish a time to rest after they've gone up a, a section of the fishway and so it's it's called either a turn pull or resting pull but the main goal is to uh to allow the fish to take a break because of the fact that they've been using burst speed to go through those sets of baffles and um there's a whole dimension of how even turn pools are designed. They have to be the right length because we want to slow the turbulence and velocity right, right. or minimize turbulence. So you, in, you increase the width so that the, the velocity slows or the cross it's section. Flat. You increase the cross section. No, we didn't change the cross section. It's the length. Oh. We don't change. You can't change the cross section. You can only change the length of it. Shad often stack up on the inside of those turns. They create eddies and uh, uh, shad, American shad are very um, uh, behaviorally challenged. <laughs> they, 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 have, they have some very strange requirements and uh, they are finicky in some aspects. And, uh, and so that's the kind of thing that we're always dealing with fish behavior as well. So you have fish swimming capabilities and behavioral aspects. Uh, American shad don't like air bubbles. They do not like air turbulence entrainment. Yeah, different own, size, different things. shape. Different times of year too, right? They yep, the shad come up later. Yeah. So the shad run typically starts, although there are shad in the, in the lower Connecticut River right now, the shad that come into um, the Pawkatek usually show up in early May. So we've got about another um, two weeks or so before the shad really start taking up, up the Pawkatuck, whereas the uh, alewife already showed up you know, back in late March. So they're they're ahead by over a month. And blueback herring, the peak of blueback herring runs typically in a river, Streamer River, about three weeks after the Elowife peak is. And so they're all staggered. Uh, I'm sure it has to do, uh, through evolution anyways, why they were staggered in time. Because you can only fit so many fish through a stream. <laughs> so we're down at the entranceway right now. So we're at the downstream end of the fishway what's called the entrance way. And so uh, we're the, we really want to have a, uh, what's called a flow jet coming out of the fish way that attracts the, uh, the adult river herring and chad and the other fish that are passing to come into the fish way. So we have its design, uh, today we've got a lot of water here, but um, in a normal condition during the spring, uh, we have a nice flow jet that comes out into this pool at the entrance where the fish are typically stacked up and they're all waiting to go into the fishway to take their turn. And, um, and that's how they get in there. Uh, and so the flow jet, which typically is about a six to nine inch drop, uh, you know, from the entrance of the fishway into the, into the entrance pool is that flow attraction that gets fish into the fishway. The fish are following the current. Yeah. And otherwise, they would just end up in the. They just end up over there. And that, and some of them do. Some of them don't find the entrance, and they'll end up in the in the falls of uh, the dam, or the spillway of the dam. So when the juvenile hearing are coming back down, yeah. we, we shut down the fishway, so all the water goes through here, and it dumps them out, so they don't have to go through all those baffles. Because if you think about when the when the uh, Juveniles are these, they're very uh, fragile. Yeah. 
And so they're, you know, two to maybe two and a half, three inches long. And um, we want to minimize injury of the juvenile hearing going out. And so what we, uh, and that's if they hit, if they were to hit the baffles in particular, and they lose scales and they can, they can, uh, there could be mortality from that. So we have this, we developed this uh, uh, bypass out migration uh, route. And so essentially the fish only have to pass through a, a much shorter distance of baffles and then they get shot out into the river and they drop down in the river, even with lower flows. And so we always develop a, an out migration design to make sure there's enough water depth that uh, uh, from the, the fall of the fish, because they're not, they're essentially gonna fall into the water and right. we wanna make sure they're gonna fall in a safe place and not on a bunch of rocks. Yeah. Right. So the eels go, so this is completely, a completely parallel, separate setup. So uh, eel, American eel are, is a uh, catagomous species. So they spend most of their life in fresh water. The adults, spawn somewhere mysteriously in the Sargasso Sea, down in the Caribbean, uh, within the Bermuda Triangle area, and then they die afterwards. And then so the, the uh, larvae that come off of a spawn in the Sargasso Sea are carried by uh, the currents, the Atlantic uh, currents, and come off in gyres, uh, you know, water uh, gyres in the ocean. And wherever they land, they end up going up some estuary or small stream or river that attracts them uh, when they become what's called glass eels. And so get up past the berry, they either have to climb a wet uh, face of, of a wall or, gr or, or grass uh, during a wet grass, a rainy night to get over upstream of a barrier. But the way these eel passes are designed um, we actually have two different substrates inside uh, that we keep wet. So we trickle water flow, very small trickle flow through different, two different size substrates. One is called bristle substrate. And so if you can think about a strip that's uh, six inches wide and extends in this fish uh, eel pass for about 50 or 60 feet, that's what it looks like is a strip of bristles that are stand up uh, maybe a couple inches above the, the substrate itself. And those are set up for the smaller eels like elvers because of their body size. And then on the other, uh, right next to that, we have another six inch strip of these uh, larger size cones. And so the cones are for, uh, set up for what's called larger uh, yellow, e yellow phased eels. And so these are juveniles that may have already been in the river a year or two, and they are just decide for whatever reason to go upstream. And of course, they're bigger, and, they're, and they have a, 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 a movement pattern very similar to a snake. And so they need some kind of structure to, uh, to mechanically make their way up the, through the set of cones. Cross is going actually. Yeah, we had, a, we had to design this over the fishway. And then way. think about this, it has to go up there then. So. It was, a, it was quite a feat. This is probably the most expensive eel pass, perhaps on the East Coast anyway. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And it was, we tested it. We had a prototype that was tested up at the Conti uh, Fish, uh, uh, Conti Anadromous Fish Lab in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts. So one of the questions I had was, do all, so herring, go, they go up, to spawn and then they go back. They're not like salmon that die. They go once and that they die. They die right. right? Yeah, so uh, the, the, the river herring is a multiple spawner. It does not die after it spawns. It goes, if it survives the long journey to get up river uh, and can go back down and still be alive, it can go back to the ocean for another year and then return once again. And so there are repeat spawners that we have uh, for, for river herring. It's known that some fish have returned four or five times, but uh, in more recent times, we have many fewer 
repeat spawners uh, because of all the uh, predators out in the ocean and on the way to, back to the ocean. And so there's a lot fewer, uh, lower percentage of uh, river herring that we typically have as repeat spawners. Mostly less than 20% of the fish that return may be uh, repeat spawners. So the other question I had was, when you see all these fish below the below the dams, just sitting in the current, do some of them just give up and go home, or I mean, go back to the ocean, or do they all end up going through? Uh, so when you find a, a bunch of uh, uh, river herring stacked up downstream of a, a barrier, uh, they'll they'll spend quite a bit of time trying to get past that barrier. Uh, no fishway is, is perfectly, uh, it works perfectly. Uh, some fishways have a high passage efficiency, but a lot of them do not. They'll be lower and maybe 70, 80% of the fish pass uh, a pretty good uh, fishway that is uh, designed. So a good, a good passage would be in the 70s or 80s? Yeah, a good passage, uh, a, what, what's called passage efficiency, uh, probably about 85% uh, and higher would be considered a good fishway, good functioning fishway. Um, and we've learned a lot over the years uh, in how these are built and are designed and built. And um, the fish that gets stacked up downstream of a barrier or a fishway, they're waiting to find that entrance. They're waiting to uh, try to pass that journey uh, over that barrier. And um, they, uh, they typically uh, will do that until they get exhausted. And so some fish die that, that don't, uh, that are unable to pass. And um, there are some that will uh, hypothetically give up and, or they may spawn uh, downstream of the barrier if it's possible. Uh, but some do, I think, in fact, give up and, and, and go back to the ocean or die from exhaustion. Right, or, or just sit there long enough to get eaten by a gull. Yeah, that, they, <laughs> that's another issue is uh, pre the longer that the fish have to wait to pass the greater likelihood is they're going to get eaten by a, a cormorant, a gull, an osprey, a heron, a, a mink that are along the edge. There are so many animals that feed on herring. They're, they're a foundation fish and um, they, they basically support both uh, the saltwater marine uh, and freshwater ecosystems with an incredible number of uh, predators that seek to eat them. So, uh, for fishways, it really takes a blending of multiple disciplines to figure out how to design uh, and construct these fishways. So you really need to understand the fish biology, the biology of the, the, the species that you're trying to pass. So in this case, mostly river herring and perhaps American shad uh, up here at, uh, in Shannon. Uh, we also need to have uh, engineers, and they're typically both civil engineers and structural engineers because with a tentacle fishway, a lot of uh, 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 knowledge is needing and needed in both civil and, and structural engineering. And lastly, you really need somebody with expertise in, in uh, hydrology. So a hydrologist understands the flow of water and the amount of water and the rate of flow that it determines uh, how much water is going to pass through the fishway to accommodate the fish that have a certain uh, swimming capability. And, uh, and so we put that all together and that's how we get a fishway design.